Happy Easter! Great to be with you today. Uh, welcome. If you're new with us, we are so glad that you joined us. Um, there are connection cards in the racks in your row. You're welcome to complete those, uh, and those will be going in the offering plates later in the service. I'll mention something about that in a moment. Um, we would uh, invite you, as, as the offering plates are passed later, um, connection cards can go in there. Um, and that is kind of new for those of you who are not new. Uh, and have been with us for a while, uh, offering plates. We're going back to that today, so just pay attention to that. Um, you can also give online by clicking on the Give tab on our website or app or by using text to give Information about that is available on the back of the bulletin along with a QR code. Um, and yes, uh, you can use your phone during worship to use text to give <laughs> Um, I want to thank our musicians today, Meg Redmond, uh, Pamela Carlson on organ and piano, our instrumentalists and choir, as well as all of those assisting with worship today. So grateful uh, for all of your contributions. We had an amazing Easter extravaganza yesterday, so much volunteer help, uh, so many people uh, packed the church yesterday. It was just great energy, wonderful outreach. There is, uh, left from that yesterday, an I Spy walkthrough. Um, down the child care and preschool hallways uh, that you're welcome to uh, use today. And we also have a space uh, for parents and kids uh, in back off to the right uh, if your children need a break during the service. And then uh, don't miss the children's message in here uh, in just a bit as well. Finally, we have free cookies from Cookie Cart in Minneapolis today following worship. Cookie Cart helps build equity with first job experiences and leadership training for teens in Minneapolis and St. Paul, so we're happy to support them and provide you with a treat today. Those are our announcements. Let's stand for our gathering hymn. <laughs>
Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Alleluia. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Together, let us pray. God of mercy, we no longer look for Jesus among the dead, for he is alive and has become the Lord of life. Increase in our minds and hearts the risen life we share with Christ and help us to grow as your people toward the fullness of eternal life with you. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated, uh, but invite kids forward for a children's message. Given a minute for all the kids to come up here. <laughs> Sometimes it takes a little bit. <laughs> well, happy Easter, everybody. Uh, I have something with me today. An egg. An egg, yes. What would you say, based on your knowledge, what's in this egg? What? What is in here? Um, it's like it's um, a orange thing, but I don't know what it's called. That's okay. Does anyone know what it's called? Yeah. Yolk. Yolk. Yeah. Because we've eat, some of us have eaten eggs before, so inside an egg, we know it's yolk. What about if a hen sits on it? What, become, what can an egg? A, a chick. chick. Yeah. We, we know this because we have seen it before, right? Every time we see an egg, we know there's probably going to be yolk, or if, it's, uh, if a hen sits on it, it might become a chick, or if some other animals lay eggs, and it might become that animal too. But, so, let's see if you are right. Were you right? Yes. Yeah. There's yolk in that egg. So now I'm going to tell you a little bit about Easter. A long, long time ago... Jesus died on a cross on what we call Good Friday. 
And when he died, a bunch of people put him in a tomb. But uh, we couldn't see him right away. The people that went to go take care of him afterward couldn't see him right away because it was something called Passover. So he sat there for three days, and he was not alive. But then on Easter morning, on Sunday, something else happened. There's two, well, a few people that went to the tomb. Mary and Mary. Yeah, they were both named Mary. <laughs> and they went to the tomb. Does anyone know what was in the tomb? Yeah. Yeah, Jesus was, rose from the dead. He wasn't there. The tomb was empty. I have another egg. Based on your knowledge, what do you think is in this egg? A yolk? Maybe nothing. Let's see. harder to do with one hand. Nothing. There was nothing in there. And just like on Easter morning, there was nothing in the tomb, there was nothing in this egg. And we can celebrate because Jesus is alive. And that's why we celebrate Easter. <laughs> I'll tell you later how I did it. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Can you all pray with me? Dear God, thank you so much for Jesus, and thank you for Easter, that we can celebrate that Jesus is alive and that we are forgiven for all of our sins. In your name we pray, amen. All right, you guys can go back to your seats. A reading from 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter. Now I should remind you, brothers and sisters, of the good news that I proclaimed to you, which you in turn received, and which also you stand, through which also you are being saved, if you hold firmly to the message that I proclaimed to you, unless you have come to believe in vain. For I handed on to you, as of the first importance, what I in turn have received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers and sisters at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have died. Then he appeared to James and to all the apostles, Last of all, as to someone untimely born, he appeared also to me. For I am the least of his apostles, unfit to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace towards me has not been in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them. Though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. Whether then it was I or they, so we proclaim, and so you have come to believe. Here ends the reading. Holy Gospel according to John. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Then Peter and the other disciple set out and went toward the tomb. The two were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent down to look in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb. 
He saw the linen wrappings lying there and the cloth that had been on Jesus' head not lying with the linen wrappings but rolled up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who reached the tomb first also went in and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples returned to their homes, but Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head and the other at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. When she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know that it was Jesus. She said, Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you looking for? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabuni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not hold on to me, because I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated. <clears throat> Well, again, happy Easter. If you travel about an hour north of Seattle, you will come to the Skagit Valley. It's one of the most fertile areas in the country and the world. It's an ancient alluvial plain created from water and sediment flowing down from the Cascade Mountains out toward the Puget Sound. I lived there for a year when I was beginning my ministry Every spring, the Skagit Valley hosts a tulip festival, and the fields are filled with tulips of every possible color and variety imaginable. People come from all over the state and the country to see all of it. It's the largest tulip festival in North America. About 20 million tulip bulbs are harvested every year, and another 75 million cut flowers, including daffodils, are grown in fields and greenhouses nearby. The Skagit Valley accounts for about 75% of tulip production in the U.S. The festival begins tomorrow, actually, and lasts the entire month of April, and the tulips bloom as they see fit. <laughs> Even if you don't think you like tulips, um, it's kind of hard not to be inspired. It's an emphatic statement that spring has arrived. If you ever can time a visit there in April, it's, it's worth seeing. Every spring, we see renewal happen. It's a reminder that life is persistent. Those of us who live in the Midwest and other northern climates are lucky to see this cycle of death and rebirth and dormancy back to vitality every year. The natural world helps us see the abundance of creation. Wait long enough and hope returns. Love is restored. Peace can be experienced once again. Easter is a celebration of Jesus' resurrection from the dead. A couple of weeks ago, we heard Jesus foreshadow his death and resurrection and say, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. He was pointing out the natural process of death and new life found in the natural world to talk about his own coming resurrection. Resurrection is unique, but we can begin to understand it by observing the natural world around us. We know that for Jesus and each of us, life involves moving through the barren seasons of the year and our hearts also. Sometimes new life in the places we most need it can seem like a world away. But in faith, we're called to wait and trust. As we do so, we need to know that life isn't always restored in exactly the same way. If you are looking for signs of hope and new life for yourself or for the world, it's important to notice something 
about the Easter story. When new life does come, it can be difficult to recognize at first because it doesn't always appear as we expect. In the hours after Jesus' death, his disciples and those who followed him were devastated. He suffered one of the worst methods of public execution. Grief and fear overwhelmed them. But on the third day, Mary ventured out to the tomb and discovered it empty. In shock, she went to find the disciples, and two of them came to see. But their initial responses weren't the joy and amazement that we imagine on Easter. John explains, for as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Jesus had been telling them what was coming again and again, but they just couldn't understand it because it had no precedent. The only emotional response comes from Mary who's weeping. She's not only overwhelmed with grief, but now it seems this sacred place has been violated. What more can happen? But that's when she sees the two angels and then Jesus, who she mistakes at first for a gardener. She says, sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you've laid him. And that's when he speaks to her, Mary. And hearing his voice, her eyes are opened. Mary knows his voice. There's a quality you can hear in someone's voice that you've come to know. This initial confusion and inability to recognize him is something we hear in many accounts when Jesus appears to his disciples after his resurrection. It's kind of a surprising twist. I mean, wouldn't he just look the same? But it seems his appearance is just different enough that they don't immediately recognize him until they identify him through his words, his wounds, and other qualities that point to the person that he truly is. Do you know Jesus through his words and the tone and spirit of his teachings? Christian faith means becoming familiar with the voice of Jesus, which sounds like grace and encouragement and peace. If we have that voice guiding us, we can become better attuned to signs of new life that may be different than what we're expecting, especially when what we're seeing around us seems to be the opposite so often. Mary arrived at the tomb and understandably she expected to find signs of death. So much of our own vision today can become occupied with signs of loss or deterioration that we see perhaps in ourselves or others where perhaps our society or the world at large. Much of that may be real when we look at things like war, division, changes in climate, but also personal challenges that we or loved ones are confronted with. The world went through what felt like a barren season during the pandemic. Some things went dormant. As the world was starting to come out of it, experts across sectors said things wouldn't just go back to the way they were before. And that has been true in a number of ways. Some things are about the same. Others have fallen away. A lot has adapted and shifted like life always does. Habits and patterns have changed. But we need to learn the lesson Mary did on Easter that new life can look different than the life that preceded it. Embracing renewal means being open to life that appears differently than it did before. It means engaging in our faith journey in new ways, beginning new patterns. Otherwise, we may miss the life that's in front of us. Jesus spoke about serving and loving the neighbor. If we're attuned to the voice of Jesus, it, it will mean we have to go beyond our schedules and priorities at times to, pri to, pr to prioritize community and relationships. And in that commitment to love our neighbor, we find our purpose and meaning. Loving neighbor is at the heart of Jesus' teachings. And this is something uh, at All Saints that we continue to pursue. We're committed to making a relevant impact by creating relationships with local organizations and our neighbors and positively shaping the tone and the uh, culture of our community through meaningful conversations. We believe our souls, each of our souls need care and we offer opportunities for everyone to pursue well-being connected to faith. And as we find greater well-being in ourselves, we discover new bandwidth and inspiration 
and we can turn our focus to loving and serving others. We begin to see the world with fresh eyes through the lens of gratitude. The story of Easter is about hope, and it's also about the resurrection of life and gratitude. Albert Schweitzer, who was a theologian and Nobel Peace Prize winner, said the greatest thing is to give thanks for everything. He who has learned this knows what it means to live. He has penetrated the whole mystery of life, giving thanks for everything. Now by that, he didn't mean that we have to give thanks for bad things, but we give thanks in spite of them. Gratitude is an emotion and a perspective. It's also an ethical way of life. Um, because in finding it within ourselves, we also find the goodness around us, including in others, and it helps us focus, encourage us, helps us focus on encouragement and grace toward others rather than resentment. All of the failings and shortcomings we see in the world may be real, but our most profound response does not involve bringing anger and disappointment to bear on them. Instead, it may come from finding reasons for connection with those that frustrate you, or looking for goodness, reasons for hope, and opportunities for action. When we bring God's love to bear in tangible ways in everyday relationships at work or in our community, we're cultivating the soil that we live in and making new growth possible. Author Diana Butler Bass has written a book called Grateful, The Transformative Power of Giving Thanks. As a Christian historian, she explores her own struggle with personal gratitude and ultimately traces the idea of gratitude back to its social origins in Roman and earlier European practice in which gratitude in society functioned more as a system of obligatory reciprocity. I did this for you, so now you owe me. I'm your benefactor. It was a system of quid pro quo. I did this for you, maybe you do something nice for me someday. With the emergence of democracies and the move away from feudal and royal and tribal and sectarian and authoritarian societies, the practice, practice of gratitude began to change. Rather than obligation required, it began to shift to something not required, but a state of our hearts and minds that moves us to share something with others in response. It might mean sharing an authentic word of thanks. It might mean devoting our time, energies, or resources to encourage and support community and a common purpose. Bass writes, gratitude is defiance of sorts, the defiance of kindness in the face of anger, of connection in the face of division, and of hope in the face of fear. Gratefulness does not acquiesce to evil, it resists evil. That resistance is not that of force of direct confrontation. Gratitude undoes evil by tunneling under its foundations of anger, resentment, and greed. Thus, gratitude strengthens our character and moral resolve, giving each of us the possibility of living peaceably and justly. She acknowledges that gratitude is not some panacea psychologically or politically that denies pain or overlooks what's wrong, but gratitude invalidates the false narrative that these things are the sum total of human existence, that despair is the last word. Gratitude gives us a new story. On Easter, the resurrection of Jesus gave us a new story. What seemed to be the darkest of days became reason for hope and joy and gratitude. During the year I lived in the Skagit Valley, I found myself grateful so often, uh, being near the mountains and the Puget Sound, the natural surroundings, along with new opportunities I had to serve and make a difference. During that year, I spoke with my grandfather on the phone. He was an avid gardener and um, he taught me really how to start a new vegetable garden in our backyard growing up. He had an incredible garden, raspberries, vegetables, and flowers. And knowing what I did about Skagit Valley tulips, I told him I would bring back some bulbs for him to add to his garden. But during my time there, uh, my grandfather passed away. 
And when I came home at the end of the year, I brought the tulip bulbs I promised and planted them in front of his gravestone uh, alongside my grandmother. I was so grateful for what he had meant to me over the years. And planting the bulbs was a sign in my own heart of the new life that comes forth from the barren earth and an assurance of the new life that Jesus promises us. If you go to Jerusalem today looking for a gravestone for Jesus, you won't find one. You can visit places that claim to be the original site of the tomb where he was buried, but there's no actual grave site because Jesus is not buried anywhere. <laughs> he is risen. That seemed inconceivable to his disciples in their darkest hours after witnessing his death on the cross. Grief dominated everything. There may be moments in our own lives, even now, when it's difficult to see the path ahead. We see only loss and a future dominated by uncertainty and fear. But the resurrection points us to a singular hope, to the victory of love over antagonism, of peace over hostility, of gratitude over grief. God's love, in all of its implausible persistence, has risen to create a new world. Like spring, all things are made new. Sometimes you have to listen for the true voice of Jesus and look again to recognize it. God's love and hope wins even in the face of the real griefs that we bear. And that new life is shared with you today. Christ has risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia.
Let us pray. Mighty God, in whom we know the power of redemption, you stand among us in the shadows of our time. As we move through every loss and trial of this life, uphold us with the knowledge of the final morning when in the glorious presence of your risen Son, we will share in his resurrection, redeemed and restored to the fullness of life and forever freed to be your people. Send us out with the joy of Mary Magdalene to proclaim that we have seen the Lord so that all the world may celebrate with you the banquet of your peace. And finally, creator of the universe, you made a beautiful world and continue to redeem it as shown and offered in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. We pray that wherever your image is still disfigured by poverty, sickness, selfishness, war, and greed, that the new creation in Jesus Christ may appear in justice, love, and peace. To the glory of your name, amen. We continue with the offering at this time. Your, your gifts are greatly appreciated. You may be seated.
The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, for the glorious resurrection of our Savior Jesus Christ, the true Paschal Lamb, who gave himself to take away our sin, who in dying has destroyed death, and in rising has brought us to eternal life. And so with Mary Magdalene and Peter and all the witnesses of the resurrection, with earth and sea and all their creatures, and with angels and archangels, cherubim and seraphim, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people, for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. And we join in the prayer that Jesus taught. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. The table is ready. All are welcome for communion. Uh, the ushers will direct you down the center aisle and there will be two lines. Uh, there are cups on either side uh, for each side of the sanctuary today. Uh, as you come forward, we'll have continuous communion. Uh, you'll receive a wafer and uh, you'll also uh, have the cup with you and we have gluten-free, so let us know if you need that. We also have grape juice, so you can let us know about that as well. Um, empty cups can be placed in the baskets on the side aisles as you return to your seats. All are welcome. Please come.
May the body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace now and forever. Amen. Amen. Gracious God, in you we live and move and have our being. With your true voice and this meal of grace, you have nourished our life together. Strengthen us to show your love and serve the world in Jesus' name. Amen. Now may God, who has brought us from death to life, fill you with great joy. Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless you now and forever. Amen. Let's stand for our sending hymn. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Go in peace. Share the good news. Thanks be to God.